Welfare support, in fact, does not discourage people from working. It's quite the opposite. It allows people to invest in launching a productive activity, it allows them to acquire new skills, it allows them to pay for childcare, it allows them to be protected from risks such as accidents that would otherwise make it impossible for them to make a decent livelihood. In fact, both in the North and in the South, even modest levels of social support can make a significant difference for families and improve the ability to work. In fact, some programs allow people to be better trained and thus to have improved employment prospects. In Sierra Leone, for example, a public works program allowed the beneficiaries to increase their chances of finding full-time employment after the program by 34%, simply because they had acquired new skills by participating in the program. Stereotypes about people in poverty abusing the system have been perpetuated since the 1980s. But in fact, the studies we have show things are very different. In rich countries, such as the UK, Canada, Ireland, New Zealand, the United States, fraud is estimated to represent 2 to 5% of the total budgets of social protection, a minuscule amount. And in fact, the problem here is that many social services fear fraud so much that they require more and more documentation, so much so that people in poverty, fearing that they will not be able to provide that documentation and to overcome these administrative hurdles, will renounce claiming their benefits. This is known as the phenomenon of non-take-up of rights. And it leads to this paradox that social protection benefits less people in poverty than people from the middle class. Social protection is not a cost, it's an investment in the future. It strengthens the ability of societies to absorb shocks. It makes societies more equal. And this has huge benefits for the poor and for the rich within society alike. Better health, higher life expectancy, less crime, improved education for the children. The challenge today is to extend social protection to all universally with a specific focus on low-income countries. This is a moral duty and it is an objective that can be reached. Many people hesitate to contribute to the financing of social protection because they believe this only will benefit the poor. The organization ATD Fourth World once calculated that in France, whilst the bulk of social protection goes to old age pension and to healthcare, only a small fraction, about 2.5%, benefits only people in poverty. In fact, only a very small part of total spending in those countries go to unemployment benefits. It's about 0.6% of the GDP of OECD countries that goes to supporting job seekers. In comparison, pensions, for example, represent 12 times that amount, about 7.7% of the GDP of OECD countries. Social protection, it's an insurance against risk that all members of society can enjoy. Social protection obviously reduces poverty, but it also has positive impacts for the economy as a whole. In India, for example, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act was shown to reduce child labor for boys by 13.4% and for girls by 8.2%. Stronger social protection reduces the barriers that women face when they seek to return to employment, because it is normally women that shoulder the burden of childcare or of taking care of older persons or of sick people. Where it exists, social protection is a powerful force for protecting individuals and societies from risks 
and for building resilience. It strengthens societies and households, it redistributes wealth, it allows families to invest in well-being and in long-term prosperity for a life in dignity.